Mobility Research Manager with the UCLA Institute of Transportation Studies. Uh, it is so great to be in this space with so many different folks who I know from different projects and, uh, and collaborations. Thank you for joining us downtown today. So uh, for this panel about traction research in action, we are going to start with hearing um, from my colleague, Jacob Wasserman and scrolling down to our speaker bios. Let me tell you a little bit about Jacob. Maybe we only have speaker bios for some of the later speakers, I see. Okay. You, you don't need to know me. <laughs> well, Jacob is our fabulous uh, transit research uh, manager at UCLA ITS and is involved in a number of projects that have to do with the transit space. And I'll let him come on up here and tell us about one of them. Thanks, Adonia. Um, so I'm going to present today on uh, research that was just released earlier in the month on the people who make transit run, the uh, frontline workers, issues they're facing, and possible reforms and futures. Um, this was done with Ali Paget and Keenan Doe, two amazing um, now graduates of our master's program, um, and myself. Um, so first, just uh, a question. I, I am curious. Is anybody in the room a, a current or former frontline transit employee? All right. So, oh, someone in the back. Um, so we, part of the reason that we wanted to do this research was because there's a disconnect between the academic um, side looking at all the, you know, finance and ridership. Um, and the labor issues, um, which are studied by labor, the Labor Center at UCLA and labor economists, but rarely do the two come together. Um, but it became a particular issue um, in 2022 and, and early 2023. Um, these are just some sample headlines from California, but we saw the same thing across the country. Um, in four different surveys, more than nine in 10 transit agencies had major shortfalls uh, or sorry, had shortfalls in bus operators, um, couldn't hire or retain people enough to sustain their service. Um, we did a survey, 70% had great difficulty in filling open positions and three in 10 in another survey by the group Swiftly had um, over one third of their positions vacant for bus operators. Um, and 83% of uh, respondents in that survey also expected these shortages to continue for at least a year from when it was um, taken. And so uh, uh, just a quick note on terminology before I go further. Um, these frontline workers, we also talked to some mechanic representatives, but um, main focus here is on bus and train operators. And, and they like to be called operators as opposed to drivers because they do more than just drive the vehicle. They collect fares, they give directions, they serve as a social worker and police officer all in one, um, protecting and keeping safe the people on their vehicle. Um, and so with this, um, these shortages were preventing service from being restored. LA Metro was flush with um, federal stimulus dollars at the time. Um, it had a plan and certainly demand um, in mid-2022 for restoration, but um, at least at the time, and it's been remedied somewhat since, did not have the bodies, did not have the people to drive the buses. Um, so Keenan, Ali, and I took a look at um, first um, quantitative sources of wage data um, collective bargaining agreements from across the state, and then some interviews. We interviewed management, labor union leadership, um, riders advocates, and operators themselves. And, you know, they agreed on absolutely everything. Uh, no, they didn't. And I will get into some of that in a second. But first, um, I'll talk about wages and our findings there. So the first thing you might see is that there is a lot of variation. These are the um, some of the top ridership uh, agencies in the state. Um, and both between agencies and within agencies, there's a huge variation. And this data is from the state controllers. And we did some cleaning, but it does include some people who worked partial years. Um, but even so, um, more senior operators are earning um, quite a good salary and, and less senior operators are definitely more precarious. Um, and the other thing we noticed is that over the past decade, adjusted for inflation, wages have largely stagnated with, in fact, on a lot of the major agencies in the state, some declines in the 
two or three years leading up to COVID. Um, we saw as well a regional divide, broadly speaking, in Southern California, especially um, San Diego, Long Beach Transit. The average, the uh, median operator wage was quite low. And in the Bay Area, it was higher. Some of that has to do with cost of living, um, but some of that just has to do with the agreements that these unions have in place and differences in the governance and work culture there. Um, so we also found just isolating the latest year of data we had was 2021 um, at the time we looked at this study, but just isolating those years, um, you can see declines during the pandemic. And that wasn't that the, the actual sticker rate that people were getting paid got cut, but one was a rise in inflation that we all know about. Um, and there was salary freezes that kept salaries flat as inflation ate into that. And then another was that senior operators retired um, for reasons I'll get into and were replaced by more junior operators, thus pulling down the median wage. Um, but this, this all led to vicious cycles of people leaving more gaps in service leading to more people leaving. But in the time since these last data, our interviews revealed some recent gains in contract negotiations. Um, first is even outside of contract negotiations, workers were getting retention bonuses. They were getting sign-on bonuses, um, multi-thousand dollars each. Um, BART opened up its contract mid-cycle, which if you're in the labor space, never happens voluntarily, um, and gave 10% across the board rate wages because they simply did not have train operators. Um, and then during the negotiations itself, unions had an upper hand, perhaps in some sense for the first time in decades, one, because agencies just needed people. And so they came to the table with wage raises already. And then because they did organizing, um, especially in the Bay Area, there was a lot of organizing around hazard pay um, for workers during COVID. Um, one explanation we heard a lot is maybe transit operators are leaving for trucking. Um, and 36% of transit workers surveyed by the American Public Transit Associ Transportation Association saw that their pay was co competitive with similar jobs, 36%, but 44% disagreed with that. They didn't think their pay was competitive, even with similar jobs that require a commercial driver's license. Um, so we looked at trucking, but interestingly, trucking, you earn much less. Um, and so... This points one, maybe it's overblown that people are leaving for trucking. Again, from that APTA survey, 22% of former workers left for other jobs in transportation like trucking, but around 27% were leaving for jobs outside of transportation. But it also points to the fact that it is more than just wages. People were willing to leave public transit for trucking even if it meant a pay cut, maybe there was a sign on bonus, trucking companies also did that, but even if it meant a pay cut. And that brings us to working conditions. Um, so before I get into the issues, um, just one benefit is that bus operators and mechanics, it's a blue collar job that often gives you very good health and retirement benefits. Um, it's a significant perk of the job. We heard it from interviewees. Um, that's a lot of the reason people get into it. But we found a host of issues. First is a very slow seniority and wage progression. The first five years as an operator, you might be classified as extra board, meaning you really don't um, know until the day before what routes you're gonna choose and routes are chosen in seniority order. So the people there longest get the first pick and there may be justifications for that, but um, that is the case at almost every agency we talk to. A two-tiered pension system. In 2015, there was pension reforms that basically meant that overtime pay no longer counted toward the calculation of your pension for anybody hired after that, which really reduced people's pension benefits because a lot of pay is overtime in transit. High housing costs. We talked to an operator who drives an hour and a half um, to then operate a public transit bus. Um, he even suggested that they should send a bus of the agency driven by one of their operators out to collect all the other operators um, because they could not afford to live close to their depots. Um, they have grueling schedules and overtime on um, agencies, particularly LA Metro, the shortages led to mandatory callbacks. Basically on your scheduled day off, you had to come in in reverse seniority order, um, which again, prompted people to quit. 
Um, security and discipline concerns. Operator assaults are a big deal, and they've been increasing lately. Um, and the worst of these, of course, was the horrific shooting at the VTA Guadalupe yard. And we talked to a, a survivor of that, um, John Courtney, um, by a disgruntled employee. And, and uh, he talked about how the agency did not provide mental health, adequate mental health resources, both before and especially after the shooting for the employees. Um, barriers to initial hiring. There is um, stringent drug testing because these are federally funded um, Transit agencies, you cannot um, have used marijuana in the past month or so. The tests will pick that up, even in California. Um, but also, it takes a very long time to get your commercial driver's license, to get certified, and to get hired, and people drop out. Um, aging workforce, I believe the median age was in the 40s of operators and, and rising. Um, and um, younger workers just aren't coming in. And the pandemic exacerbated all of these concerns. And so this, there were hiring and pay freezes that um, were instituted during the pandemic, but these kind of snowballed into creating the current shortages we have today. So all in all, we found that pay raises are necessary, but not sufficient. Um, this was from Jacksonville. They were offering $15,000, but we talked to a contact at a national union. You know, people took it up, but it still didn't solve their shortage. So it, it's more than just the money here. So some reforms we found. First is reducing those hiring hurdles, um, paying for the training you need for your commercial driver's license, training in smaller vehicles before you get it. Um, having all-in-one hiring fairs and hiring in Spanish. Um, Metro has done a very good job of that, um, but you'd be surprised how few agencies do outreach in Spanish. Um, expanding outreach, making scheduling fairer. So you might still have a seniority system, but maybe you put the different runs into buckets so that they're a little more even. Um, improving the facilities and support, particularly restrooms. Operators need restrooms at the end of their run before they come back. Um, removing enforcement duties from operators. Operators are not police officers, and these fair confrontations and other confrontations often lead to assaults and violence. And creating pathways for career advancement, um, whether that be becoming a more senior operator or maybe being promoted into management. Um, Broadly speaking, I think our research points to the need to rethink transit operations funding. For years, the federal government has funded capital quite well, but not operating in part because of political animus against unions. Um, this is a graph here of change in spending since fiscal year 2015 on transit capital plus operating versus wages. And you can see it is not rise in wages that's largely led to this increase in spending. And there's a lot of benefits to this spending, but it's not going to wages. Um, addressing coming automation concerns, are workers going to become kind of like airplane pilots where they're only there in the worst situations? Are they going to become like ambassadors? Who knows? And the ultimate point is that workforce issues are rider issues. Previously, it had been said it's a zero sum game. But as we saw during the pandemic, you need a workforce to actually get riders where they need to go. And if you don't have that, riders are going to be stuck waiting at the bus stop. So thank you so much. Um, our report is out at its.ucla.edu, and I'm happy to talk about any of those bullet points I went over really fast um, in the questions. Thank you, Jacob, for a fantastic and succinct presentation. Next, we're going to hear from Manos Prusaluglu, who is Assistant Director of City Lab, a multidisciplinary research center housed within UCLA's Department of Architecture and Urban Design. Having received dual master's degrees in architecture and urban planning from UCLA, his work interrogates the impact of public policy on the built environment, with a specific focus on the design, provision, and distribution of affordable housing. Professionally, he has worked at think tanks such as the Brookings Institution and the Center for Neighborhood Technology. He's also worked in architectural offices like Perkins and Will and Sharif Lynch Architecture. So once we get his presentation, which we have, thank you, Yu Hong, come on up. All right, hello everyone. Thanks, Adonia. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, my name is Manos Prasalaglu, Assistant Director of City Lab. And today I'll be speaking about the 210 freeway and the impacts it had on neighborhoods of color in Pasadena. 
This case study is just one quarter of a larger research effort, an effort funded by Caltrans and led by Anastasia, Susan, Paul, and an incredible team of students and staff and researchers of which I'm just one small part. Um, so in diving into the Pasadena case study, I'll cover a few important topics. First, providing some background. Second, walking through the compounding inequities that we discovered. Third, exploring the highway route decision-making process. Fourth, underscoring the disparate impacts felt by minority communities in Pasadena. And finally, concluding by discussing some implications for future community-engaged work. So we chose Pasadena as a case study for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that during the era of, era of freeway construction, it had an unusually large minority population, especially for a suburban enclave around Los Angeles. And this suburban character was also quite interesting to us. There'd been previous research on urban freeways, but we thought that the political machinations in suburbia might be even more clearly defined and discoverable. Um, the timeline for planning and construction of the 210 freeway is noteworthy too. Its development occurred during the freeway construction boom, which gripped the United States in the middle of the 20th century and coincided with the decline of the street where, excuse me, streetcar system and suburban expansion of Los Angeles. It also takes place at the geographic intersection of three proposed freeways, the 210 or the Foothills Freeway, which we'll be talking about mostly today, the 134 or the Colorado Freeway, and the 710 or the Long Beach Freeway. Finally, it's important to understand the racial context of this era. Um, while Pasadena had a significant minority population, Minority residents were largely concentrated in two neighborhoods, Orange Grove, Lincoln, and Fair Oaks. And racially restrictive covenants closed off much of the rest of the city to these populations. As civil rights lawyer Lauren Miller said in 1964, white residents can find someplace else to live without undue hardship. A black victim of freeway construction is put in a bad position. He can't go out to the new suburban areas and buy a home simply because he has the money and the desire. More often than not, he'll have to pay through the nose for a secondhand home in a community a cut below that in which he formerly lived. So with all that in mind, I'll now tell you a story of Pasadena's freeway construction through a series of graphics, all focused on the same region of Pasadena, where the three highways intersect and where the majority, uh, the minority populations were living. So on the left side of the screen behind me is a map of the minority distribution in Pasadena in 1935. The eventual freeway routes are shown with the black and the HOLC outline is shown in a white outline. Um, and on the right, you can see the actual HOLC maps. This is from 1949. A map which determined whether homeowners were eligible for federal uh, mortgage insurance. And as they do in so many other cities, the HOLC redlining maps map pretty um, perfectly on top of the area's minority concentration. Per our research, it seems like these HOLC maps set the foundation for future freeway construction in Pasadena. So moving forward to 1960, uh, Pasadena's minority populations remained concentrated in these two Northwestern communities, Orange Grove, Lincoln, and Fair Oaks. Therefore, building off of the HOLC map and following 1960's de facto racist tendencies, Pasadena's 1962 general plan identified these communities as blighted and in need of urban renewal. The same document also showed that these were two of the most densely populated parts of the city. So it's actually with the publication of the 1962 general plan that the momentum for freeway construction and importantly for a specific route alignment become increasingly clear. Um, the freeway routes that you see on the images behind me in the center and on the left, these black dotted lines were not added by the research team. They were actually included in the 1962 general plan and made it appear as if the highway construction was imminent. These routes were drawn before any public consultation and the general plan never mentions any alternatives or even the fact that the freeway was still a proposal at the time. The freeway was instead presented as fact. And as you can see in the image on the right, city planners in 1962 made a pretty good bet. Uh, Mr. Miller, once again, succinctly puts it in this way, take me to a city, a strange city where I've never been before and point out the areas in which Negroes live. And I'll lay out some neat odds that I can point out the route of the city's next freeway. So the forces that I've mentioned um, built upon each other to make the freeway feel inevitable for many Pasadena residents, but this was especially true for residents of color, amongst which there was a palpable feeling of helplessness uh, in the face of what seemed like decades of decisions that were carefully planned and inequitable. This feeling was unfortunately proven to be accurate when public discussion on freeway routes finally began in 1964. The routing debate in Northwest Pasadena largely revolved around two main alternatives, which you can see behind me here. A blue route that skirted just east of the Rose Bowl and Brookside Golf Course, and a green route that wound its way through the Orange Grove Lincoln and Fair Oaks neighborhoods on its way south towards Long Beach. 
Um, so our research team pulled together quantitative data from census tracts affected by each of these routes. Census tracts unique to the green route had minority resident shares almost twice as high as the uh, tracts that were unique to the blue route and median family income levels less than half of those that were unique to the blue route. It's also worth mentioning the voices that it seems highway engineers were listening to when evaluating these routing options. While we found dozens of newspaper articles in the LA Times, Pasadena Star News, and Pasadena Independent, local minority-run papers like the California Sentinel and California Eagle barely mentioned the freeway hearings at all. Photos we found from these events also show largely white audiences, and while neither data point is um, ironclad, taken together, the evidence seems to point to a heavily one-sided process where one community's voices were being taken into account. Um, within weeks of the hearings beginning, public testimony solidified rather strongly around the green route, with Pasadena civic leaders railing against what they called the unacceptable and monstrous blue route um, and its, uh, the proposed location of that route. So two major arguments were made um, against the blue route. The first was that it would destroy the natural beauty of the Arroyo Seco, which I read as a stand-in for the Rose Bowl parking lot, which was opened in 1922, and Brookside Golf Course, which was opened in 1928. And secondly, that the green route was already perfectly aligned with the city's 1962 general plan. So first designated as unlendable by the HOLC, then labeled as blighted and split by a hypothetical freeway in the 1962 general plan, decades of urban planning decisions made the green route feel like it was preordained. In other words, by 1964, there was no logical choice except to follow it. Um, so this disastrous decision had dire consequences for what was once a vibrant minority community in Pasadena. For our research, the green route displaced seven times as many residents, displayed, excuse me, destroyed seven times as many homes, and affected far more minority residents than the blue route would have done. While it may have been made to feel inevitable, all of our data suggests the blue route would have been far less detrimental to Pasadena as a whole. Aligning the 210 along the proposed blue route would have allowed for the continued vibrancy, connection, and growth of civic centers like Fair, um, excuse me, Orange Grove Lincoln and Fair Oaks. And the selection of this particularly destructive green route is made even more stark when comparing it to freeway routing decisions made in areas around Northwestern Pasadena. Public outcry in wealthier and whiter La Cañada Flint Ridge led to the submerging of the freeway, led to a routing decision that saved hundreds of homes in that neighborhood, and freeway caps were actually installed as well that gave back park space to city residents. Similar mitigation measures were taken in central Pasadena to uh, avoid the destruction of, and I quote, attractive residences of high quality, and to avoid the creation of an area in which no one will care to own a home. These same arguments applied in Orange Grove, Lincoln, and Fair Oaks, but in those neighborhoods, they fell on deaf ears. In the most impressive routing win, uh, South Pasadena residents stopped 710 freeway construction in their neighborhood altogether. As you can see from the map, the gap between the Long Beach Freeway and the 210 remains open to this day. At the time of their freeway stopping success, South Pasadena was 99% white and was an active sundown town, meaning that racial minorities were allowed to work, but not to live in the neighborhood. So the case study of Pasadena's 210 freeway is relevant, um, not just because it's a local example of the perils of freeway construction, but more so because it highlights practices that planners, engineers, and policymakers should avoid. I think this case study makes the, the sort of case for the whole topic of this year's conference uh, quite clearly. As we make transportation and infrastructural investments, community engaged research and planning efforts uh, will be paramount and should be front and center. We can't afford to repeat the mistakes of the past, nor to ignore the voices of already disadvantaged communities. And as our work has shown, these communities have historically borne the brunt of our public works projects. And in such a way, and it sort of on its fundamental core, I agree with Lauren Miller when he says, I don't think it's fair to require the condemned man to pay for the hangman's rope. As we look to the future and to rectifying these mistakes, we should spend a little more time looking around to make sure all the trade-offs are worth the rewards. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Manos, for that uh, great presentation. Now we're going to hear from Chow Yu, who is a PhD candidate at UCLA's Department of Environmental Health Sciences, focusing on climate change mitigation, air quality co-benefits, zero emission vehicle policy, and environmental justice. His work has contributed to the LA100 Equity Strategies Report and involves improving clean and equitable transportation for disadvantaged communities through California Climate Action funded projects. So I'll hand things over to Chow. Thank you, Adonia. And thank you everyone for having me here today. Um, so still good morning. Uh, and my name is Chow Yu. I'm a doctoral candidate at the UCLA School of Public Health, uh, Department of Environmental Health Sciences. So today I'll be talking about how your emission vehicles in California affect air quality and APD near roads. So, um, as we move towards a carbon-free future, the role of transportation decarbonization is crucial. Um, in California, 50% of the greenhouse gas emission comes from the transportation sector, and 75 from nitrogen oxides are also coming from the transportation sector. Nitrogen oxide, a um, species of air pollutants, uh, can trigger asthma attacks, for example. Um, and by decarbonizing the transportation sector, we are also decreasing the air pollutants. And in the field of public health, we call it the co-benefits. And as public health practitioners or advocates, we are particularly interested in this co-benefits because it presents an opportunity to address public health disparities. Um, so here is just a recap of how conventional vehicles produce air pollutants. Um, so the first part involves the emissions from the tailpipe and which will have you know, secondary chemical reactions to form secondary pollutants. And the second part is really just like the physical frictions caused by brake and tire. Um, and that's the second part. In this research I'm presenting today, I'll be talking more about the direct emissions from the conventional vehicles or just vehicles uh, from like, you know, for the near road uh, air quality impacts. We do have another parallel regional air quality study. Um, it's called the LA100 Acti Strategy Study that focuses more on um, the regional air qualities. Um, and LA100 Acti Strategy um, is kind of like a strategy or a research founded by the DWP to study how to actively um, you know, moving towards a hundred percent renewable energy future uh, for all communities actually. Uh, so how do zero emission vehicles solve this issue about like air pollutants and like greenhouse gases? Well, since the energy that comes from the battery on board instead of the internal combustion engines, you know, in terms of like, instead of the combustion of the gasoline or the diesels, we eliminate the tailpipe emissions. However, it is, important to know zero emission vehicles defined by the California Air Resource Board is not 100% zero emission because we still have the emissions from, um, from brake and tire. But again, the emission from vehicles are greatly significantly reduced. So the California Air Resource Board um, defines zero emission vehicles as battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and fuel cell vehicles, which is powered by hydrogen. So I, I, I want to say just electric vehicles, but because we, we are going to have like more hydrogen vehicles in the future. So that's why I use the term zero emission vehicles. Um, so the number of zero emission vehicles uh, in California is above a million registered zero emission vehicles in 2022. And California has been the largest zero emission vehicle market in the United States since 2010. And that number is projected to increase to 15 millions uh, by the year of 2035, which account for 50% of the light duty vehicle fleet in California. So um, the next part of the background introduction, I want to first show you a picture um, of children walking through the um, Wilmington, California community, um, which is near a pollution source. And the reason I want to show this picture, and uh, this picture is taken by, actually taken by Jesse, the director of Coalition for Safe Environment, a community-based organization, which our group has been working um, with for a long time. The reason I want to show this picture is that it has two critical elements. So the first is pollution, 
the pollution exposure. And the second part is the population vulnerabilities, the children, as you see in the picture. And these two elements or the categories, the pollution burden and the pollution vulnerability, has been considered by the California Community Environmental Health Screening Tool, the Cal Environmental Screen, um, which is a tool we use to determine whether a community is at advantage or not. Um, studies show that you know children or people of color, racially and ethnically minoritized populations, are more vulnerable to the pop to the pollutants, and that is considered in the Cal Environmental Screen Tool. Over 9.3 million people now lives in the disadvantaged communities classified by the Cal Environmental Screen. And that's about 25% of the total population uh, in California. So as we witness a rapid increase in the in zero emission vehicle um, increase, um, like developments in our move towards a cleaner future, my research really want to answer two questions. So first, are dispatched communities rather than being left out in this clean transportation transition? And I will refer this to Zev Gap in the later slides. And the second question is, can zero emission vehicle help address air quality related environmental justice issues in dispatched communities? Uh, and I will refer that to neural impact in the later slides. So let's first take a look at the zero emission vehicle gap. On the left, we have the figure um, of the Cal Environmental Screen percentile, where the red color represents the community at disadvantage. Um, on the right, we have the maps visualized from 2015 to 2020. Uh, we observed the zero emission vehicle distribution expanding across different communities. However, the disadvantaged communities, as I label in the red rectangle, um, still doesn't really see an increase and the increase majorly or significantly happens near those like coastal uh, communities. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, the spatial distribution of the zero emission vehicle growth in the past five years or in that five year um, period. And next, we would like to find out how zero emission vehicle affect neural air quality. And I'm just going to quickly talk about our um, methodology. Um, so we first employ the multi-agent transportation simulation, the massive model. And importantly, we input the zero emission vehicle ownership data on each sense tract into this model. So it can help us uh, to assign, like, where do those, like, electric vehicles travel around? So with that, we put the uh, we get the emission factors from the MFAC database to generate the emissions on each specific row link, and then we put that into our R line uh, air quality dispersion model to see what's like you know its effect on air quality's near roadways. And now bringing that two pieces together, our twenty thirty five projection suggests that without any intervention, the ownership disparity of zero emission vehicles may persist, even though as the total number of like zero emission vehicle rises to the 15 millions, um, while 50% of the Los Angeles uh, population lives in disadvantaged communities, only 30% of them owns zero emission vehicle in 2035. However, um, if we look at a metric that we use to determine basically how many electric vehicles are passing through your community, EVMP, the disparity is less prominent. As you can see, the green color is more evenly distributed. And that is very, that is like an important finding from our model. And if you recall, actually it's related to the models slides, all the highway infrastructures are built in these French communities. So if we have electric vehicles in Los Angeles, it's just gonna travel around. It's gonna pass those like highway transportation infrastructures. So in a way it will share like a universal like benefits like to Los Angeles overall. So even these venture communities have may have like fewer zero emission vehicles, they can still get the benefits. So um, so that's kind of like the good news. Now let's look at into the uh, near air, near railway air quality maps. Um, so the uh, maps display the reduction of the nitrogen oxides uh, in Los Angeles County for 2020 for the year of 2020 attributable to the zero emission vehicles. So this figure illustrates um, essentially, you know, um, the disadvantaged communities, especially like near roads, as you can see, it's kind of like near those like major highways, they're receiving significant um, air quality benefits. 
However, if we consider, you know, their baseline air quality kind of like emissions or the air pollutants levels, um, and we present the data in a scale of percentage on the right figure, we saw those disadvantaged communities in the kind of like, you know, the traffic, where the traffic volumes are extremely high um, in the, you know, the middle or like the south southern part of like Los Angeles County, they still like have a very huge gap as compared to non disadvantaged communities in other sense tracts. As we move to 2035, well, that gap is getting smaller. The red rectangle is getting smaller. That means, you know, the air quality benefits are expanding into those areas because of more zero emission vehicles. However, the gaps still exist if we look at um, in terms of like a change of percentage. So what are the key takeaways, um, the findings of this research? Uh, so first of all, zero emission vehicle ownership disparity exists. Policies should target DACs with incentives, rebates, and charging infrastructure development. Second, because zero emission vehicle travels around, even communities with fewer zero emission vehicles can still share the benefits. However, the pollution exposure gaps can be, and the, the pollution exposure gaps can be reduced with increased passenger zero emission vehicle adoption. But to further understand or close the gap, we need to conduct more research on, let's say, truck electrifications and the brake and tire emissions. Um, so now knowing that disadvantaged communities need help on the kind of like the clean transportation transition, we actually have a follow up research, which is um, founded by the UCOP Climate Action Grant. Um, it's called the Community uh, Driven Electric Vehicle Charging Solution, the project CLEAN. And we aim to provide a scalable, actable, and evidence-based solution to support adoption of electric vehicles and improve the access to EV charging stations for disadvantaged communities. And here, I just want to list out the community partners we have been working with, uh, Coalition for a Safe Environment, um, Redeemer Community Partnership, as well as Pacoima Beautiful. Uh, and I know this is like a, um, a lot like, I hope it didn't like overwhelm you guys. I already deleted a lot of like technical details. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're interested in the technical details, feel free to check out our um, publications, um, one in Nature Communications, and the other is the uh, LA100 study uh, we I mentioned earlier. So with that, thank you so much for your attention, and I will um, I'll feel free to reach out if you have any questions, and I will turn the stage back to Donia. Well, uh, I really appreciated that engaging presentation on a deeply technical area, but an important one for us to have an understanding of, right, in terms of uh, being able to visualize and quantify the harms um, and how they're improving or not, right? Um, so really appreciated that from Chow. So I get to ask you all some questions for a few minutes here, and then we're going to go into um, audience Q&A. So you can use that same Slido hashtag forum 2024. Um, and Amy will be uh, curating questions from the audience. Uh, so I want to just start by, um, you know, I was thinking about how in the last panel, we kept using the, the phrase extractive research or research being extractive, and wanted to quickly just say something about uh, where that comes from, uh, for those who may not be familiar with it. So uh, the, you know, the reason we have institutional review boards and human subjects review boards at universities is because there is this real history of, in the past, uh, medical research, uh, different kinds of uh, research that relied on uh, human specimens, blood samples, cell samples, things like that people weren't asked for their consent, right? And so we had a lot of egregious examples of um, people from particularly uh, racialized communities, uh, marginalized communities, seeing their actual physical bodies being used in research in ways that um, certainly didn't directly benefit them and in some cases directly harmed them. And um, something that I think is just a, a great example of um, telling one of those stories is about um, a woman named Henrietta Lacks. Um, and there was a, a book written about her story. I think Oprah turned it into a movie. So a lot of info out there about Henrietta Lacks. So that's a good place to start if you um, are not familiar with 
uh, this extractive history of research. So in those kinds of contexts, it's literally extraction, right? Like we're taking material out of your body and then um, leaving you out of the process, dehumanizing you in terms of what we do with it. When we're talking about more social science oriented research, fortunately, we're not taking a lot of body samples, right? We're not, we're not dealing with vials of blood and stuff like that. So when we talk about extraction, it has to do with how do we both rely on local expertise, community knowledge, but then not properly attribute it or um, you know pay people uh, for that expertise that they're bringing in. And this is this is a it's a long term project. It's a research justice project to really figure out how we can shift to doing um, research with communities in a way that really breaks down some of the power divides between researcher and research subject. And, um, you know, I'm so I'm excited to talk a little bit with you all about how that has taken shape in the in the work that you're doing. So community consultation in research um, to me is really the bedrock of how we bring equity into what we're doing. But it can mean a lot of different things um, within research. There are. Uh, participatory action methodologies, community-based uh, participatory research is a really well-defined model that I believe came out of public health. Um, but in transportation research, oftentimes um, we use different methods. We're working with data sets as opposed to doing direct engagement with communities. Um, but there are a lot of different ways that people are working on empowering research participants themselves, um, bringing in particular kinds of advisors, partnering with CBOs. So I would love to hear from each of you how that showed up in the project that you shared with us today. Um, so we'll start with Jacob. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, th I think two, two places I saw it. One was um, just um, last month. Uh, as, as we were um, kind of thinking about next steps, um, Sarah White, who is our labor lead at Davis for the UC Institute of Transportation Studies, convened a group of researchers from UCLA, Berkeley, UCLA Labor Center, and we learned a lot about an apprenticeship program there um, that's getting new people into the transit workforce um, at a collaboration of industry uh, agencies across the state. Um, but just getting us into the room to get us on the same page. So before we even go out and say, okay, what are the solutions to help um, fix all these issues in, in not just transit labor, but, but transportation labor, ride hail, trucking, are we speaking the same language, um, labor folks and transportation folks getting on the same page so that when we go out there, it's not like we're totally unversed in these issues. So that's that's one step. And I think that that convening was a good start. And we're going to keep having those convenings and bring in um, leaders from uh, the labor sector as well. And then second, there was a dynamic that I don't think I resolved. And so I'll be open about that, that there are rider issues and there are workforce issues. And those can often be aligned. And I think that was a lot of the findings of the research, but they are not always. Um, I, this particularly came up in COVID around safety and security, um, issues of fare-free transit of police on vehicles. There was a deep split within the workforce. Um, I heard uh, reports of union meetings where there were different groups of operators who really had differing opinions. Um, and I, you know, myself and, and other researchers on this topic need to grapple with how, how do we synthesize those different views within groups? How do we synthesize those different views within the ridership versus the workforce um, and put forth policy recommendations and policy implications that can really help everybody while recognizing the nature of trade-offs? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we spoke about this in the pre-call too. Um, I think with the highway research work. I'm slightly conflicted on how to answer that question correctly, I think. And Jacob has been working on the project more extensively and for a lot longer than me too. So if I forget something, please uh, say it. But um, so in the Pasadena case study, for example, which was the one that I kind of ran, um, well, we were able to find a lot of sort of secondary research sources, uh, newspaper articles, like I showed maps, kind of documents like that. In other case studies that we included in the report, there was much more extensive um, kind of community engagement and outreach. There were 
you know, interviews with residents who were alive at the time of freeway construction, there were kind of probably a closer connection and kind of touch point with those, um, the other case studies. That wasn't honestly really the case in, in the Pasadena part. And I think to some degree that was a, um, a mistake on, on our end and a way that th this research as we move forward and specifically at the end where I'm kind of talking about how I imagine the work that we've done could have future implications. Like, okay, we have pr probably proven to some degree what everyone already kind of assumes or knows, which is these highways really destroyed minority communities in a lot of places. We've, we've put our kind of academic minds to that. We've given evidence that'll hopefully be more convincing to policymakers and stuff. So we've done an important service there, I think. But in then thinking about what to do next and how to build a different highway or how to invest in, in, the, in the future, um, I don't think we should follow exactly the model that we followed with this report. I think it should be much more kind of a, along the lines of what we were hearing in the first, in the first panel. Um, yeah, because we like sort of answered a question to some degree or uplifted uh, a population that probably doesn't have their voice heard all that much. So this was, a, again, a good thing that I think we did in the report. But in terms of moving forward and actually making things better, um, I think we could follow different models and more engaged models like we heard from this morning. Um. So uh, our research definitely follows a community uh, participated participatory uh, research kind of like framework. Um, I just want to talk about, um, I think to me, the way that we involve or we work with communities has two parts. The first part is we trying to uh, involve or like take communities like advices or their like intakes into our research in the first stage. So essentially, I'm just gonna talk about the LA 100 active strategies projects that we work with. Um, so essentially when we kind of like propose a research, we show it to the community members. Um, so we ask, oh, this is gonna be our research. And um, do you like to add something? Are there anything that you're interested? So we actually got feedback. So initially we were calculating the, basically um, the health benefits. So how many avoided premature death? How, how many avoided like mortalities you're gonna have with like clean transportation? And then we talk to the community members and they're like, oh, we are also interested in like how many, um, you know, um, asthma attacks going to be lowered, right? Like how many like asthma ER visits going to be like, uh, be, be kind of like lessened like for my children. So we don't need to pay that much of like medical bills, right? So these are the things they care about. So we add that into our models, add that into our results. After we finish our, you know, modeling all the scientific, like, you know, these things, we present our um, results with two versions. First version is the technical ones. We send it to, you know, the, uh, our peers in the um, academic academia areas to like ask them to like peer review it. And the second part is actually like a layman, like general audience version with all our results. So we send it to the community members, not like asking for improvements, but like really to ask for inputs. Like this is how we want to deliver our result. Does that align with your, um, you know, your goals, your agendas? Like what does it looks like to you? So we receive like that inputs from them too. So this is really the first part of our, of our research, um, trying to incorporate our research like from the beginning to the end with the community members. So that's first. And second, we are also thinking about like, you know, and I think, I feel like the first part is more like, you know, co-design, right? Co-design a research with the community members, the CBOs. The second part is we also want to empower the community members. So we do a lot of like, you know, workshops with community members. For instance, uh, right now we are um, doing the EV related works, right? Um, so we talk to the CBOs, we uh, do those like workshops with my uh, colleagues from Les King Center of like UCLA Les King Center for Innovation. Um, we work with the community members trying to help them to understand like what are the incentives you can get from the world, like, you know, everywhere, like the CARB, the LA Metro or the LA DWP, there are so many like incentive programs out there, but people in communities, they just don't know where to gather. So we want to empower, like also like to, um, you know, to, to relate to give those like knowledge to the community members to empower them so they can, you know, they won't be left out in this like clean transportation, like transition. So, um, yeah, I think that's the two part really to incorporate community members' opinions into the research, but also give back to the community to empower them. So, yeah. I really appreciate, uh, yeah, how you laid that out. So it's really involving community in the research design phase 
And then also reminds me of what uh, Tierra said earlier about uh, mutually beneficial relationships. And um, I think there's there's interesting uh, thinking to do there in terms of like an ecosystems thinking approach. Um, you know, what do we mean by mutually beneficial and um, and how can we bring that in more? So thank you all for those responses. I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to Amy now to get us into some audience Q&A. Thanks. The top voted question is from Anonymous, so I'll be the voice of them. Um, this is a question I think for each of you. Uh, what is a key finding from your work that you would like today's decision makers to know about investment in highways, in transit, and in the clean transportation transition? Yeah, uh, one, one finding. Um, I think that what, what 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 I would like to see transit agencies reckon with more and and state policymakers too is the fact that a job that on paper looks quite stable you get a pension not many people get a pension these days you get very good health benefits and those are all true and good but a a, a job that, that appears on paper quite stable can actually be quite precarious. Um, that when you're working these, um, there's something called split shifts where because transit ridership is concentrated at the morning peak, the afternoon peak, that's longer than an eight hour shift. So what they have some workers do is you work four hours, you get four hours off and you can run errands in theory, but you can't really go home. And then you work four hours afterwards and you get paid a little bit extra for it, um, but you certainly don't get paid for 13 hours straight. Um, and that that drives people away. They don't know necessarily until the day before that they're getting a split shift or an otherwise difficult shift. Um, so to, to recognize that these jobs are, are, are more precarious than they might seem and to do things that may seem out of the box in response. Um, we, we heard at, at VTA in San Jose, there was a parking lot, an agency on parking lot where uh, operators would park their cars and sleep um, sometimes overnight, sometimes during their split shifts in the middle of the day. Obviously, this is not a long term solution, but workers wanted it and the agency took it away and they were very upset. Um, and so they were advocating and it hasn't come to fruition, but to reserve units in affordable housing developments on agency land for the operators themselves. Um, so you could live close to work, you could have um, housing, you know, literally above the place where you work. Um, so to think of those outside the box solutions to issues that um, arise from from this critical role. Yeah, I guess broadly, um, from the research that we did, I mean, learning from the mistakes of Pasadena, that's an easy way to answer that question. But I think specifically, um, I showed the photos of the freeway kind of routing meetings and said how we found all this information and um, kind of more, I don't know, uh, whiter or more mainstream newspapers um, about comments about the routing meetings, but we didn't find any of that in these minority newspapers. I think I can imagine sort of the conversations of the Pasadena legislators at the moment saying like, well, we had the meeting. Everyone who showed up said we should do the green route. We didn't really hear much uh, against it. So, okay, we've done our due diligence. We're going to do that route. And I think, you know, the, the reason or one explanation maybe for why we didn't find a lot of the kind of pushback against this route is because, and I mentioned it in the presentation, everyone at the time thought it wouldn't have mattered. Didn't, whatever they said didn't really affect anything. They'd had experience over an experience of that kind of happening to them. So I think it's important to make sure that you sort of go an extra mile, let's say, to make sure you speak with every type of community and every type of person along the proposed route. You really do your due diligence to gather all the inf information um, and not kind of give yourself the easy out of like, yeah, we had a meeting, but it was on a Tuesday at noon and the people that showed up said we should do this particular thing. That that's, wasn't good enough then and it certainly, should, certainly shouldn't be good enough now. Um. Because I was more thinking about it like technically, uh, we have seen a lot of like research or actually initiatives by the Caltrans or the uh, uh, LA Department of Transportation trying to decrease the vehicle mile traveled in a way, trying to reduce the em like air pollutions or emissions, but it has been really hard. Uh, and that really um, 
attributed to what models really presented like in the 1960s, the highway um, constructions or the wide flight of all the uh, unwanted transportation infrastructures in those like disadvantaged communities. And it's really hard to really just to tear everything down and like to do like a new constructions nowadays. And I that's why I was thinking about like more um, uh, alternative ways like, oh, like we are trying to combat for climate change, right? Reduce the, um, the carbon emissions. Uh, electric vehicles, it seems like it can help it, but it's not gonna like solve the problem. It's not like a magic bullet. It's gonna solve all the problems. Um, but um, I think uh, really that's that's kind of like trying to solve it. Honestly, California is doing really great ahead of like a lot of like other government bodies in terms of like, you know, electrifications and trying to like reduce the, um, you know, the emissions um, from transportation sectors for disadvantaged communities. But I think the uh, rooted question is really to, uh, I think, um, to really improve the procedural equity. So involve the community members' voices, doing all the decision-making procedures, um, having like a, uh, you know, a kind of like a advisory committees from uh, which involves all the uh, CBOs like in affected like plannings or the construction areas. And I think really to, to achieve proceed, like to achieve distributive equity, we need to think about procedural equity first. All right. Well, uh, we are getting very close to our time here. So I think that's all we can take uh, from the audience Q&A. Uh, there's some more really good questions in the Slido. So I hope that people do feel free to engage over lunch, which is coming up next. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is I would just love to have a longer conversation than we have space for here around something um, else that we discussed in our pre-call, which is around um, what is the ethical role that researchers can play in what is often a very technical uh, policy planning and building space for transportation? Everybody's using our transportation systems every single day, but most people uh, are not engaging with you know, how we actually build and maintain and, and govern this stuff. Um, so what role can we play as researchers um, to, you know, partner with CBOs, to demystify, to share power. Um, so I'd love for us to have that conversation more long-term, but I think I'll leave things there. We are now going to uh, thank our panelists so much for sharing your research.